Thanks, Pastor Adam, for communion and worship team for some God-honoring worship. My name is Kevin Clark. I'm the senior pastor here at Encompass Church. And those of you who have been here for a while know that I am also an Oklahoma Sooners fan. I almost wore a black armband today. And I thought, no, that, that would be too much. But then some, some people are wearing orange shirts for the other side and know that I have a long memory. We're in the middle of a season of service here at Encompass Church. We began this at the beginning of October. It's going to continue all the way through uh, the third week of December. And each week we're highlighting some places that you can serve and help us reach our local community. We started a food uh, drive for some local schools in partnership with an organization called Secor. We made our first delivery last week, and uh, we're continuing that. So if you can still bring items for us to distribute to Secor for them to take to local schools, that would be greatly appreciated. Last Sunday, we held Trunk or Treat. It was amazing. We had 500 people from the community walk through our Trunk or Treat. It was indoors for those of you who weren't here uh, because of the snow, and that actually may have helped uh, draw more people. So if you help serve, we are very grateful. It was a great opportunity for us to uh, just be uh, good folks to the people nearby who may have never set foot in this church. And if you are here because you came last Sunday, welcome. We're glad to have you. Uh, this week and next week, we are highlighting the shoebox ministry. It's actually part of what's called Operation Christmas Child, run by an organization called Samaritan's Purse. Each year, they collect tens of thousands of shoeboxes filled with small items, gift items, uh, personal things like toothbrushes and toothpaste and combs and brushes, and as well as toys and other things like that, and information for kids who have never heard about Jesus to tell them what Christmas is all about. And so if you'd like to fill a shoebox, or maybe your family would like to do several, we have the shoeboxes in the lobby with the instructions, and uh, we encourage you to pick those up today if you haven't picked one up. We'd like to bring most of them back by next Sunday. We do have a backup plan for getting late ones back, and so we'll continue to hand out boxes through next week. Uh, but if you can grab those today and fill those out, or fill those and bring them, uh, we'll make sure they get to the right place. And then we want to give you a heads up that coming on the 19th, two weeks from today, is no turkey left behind Sunday. We'll be collecting uh, frozen turkeys to deliver to the Denver Rescue Mission. And uh, we collected how many last year? 46 turkeys last year. We stuffed them in the church van. We took them to the rescue mission. And a week or two later, we found one turkey in the van. So this year, no turkey left behind. So if you can make plans to help us with that, we'll collect them on that one day only. And so you can bring them on Sunday, November 19th. Uh, if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 7. We'll begin in verse 24. And as you're turning, uh, let me share with you the beginning of a brief story. I actually stumbled onto this story on a church website back in the East Coast. And the gentleman who shared his life story had recently retired. His name was Gary Kowatch. And in his, re his story of his life that he shared with his church, he said, In 1975, while attending the Westchester East High School in Pennsylvania, Gary uh, was an average student, but a multi-sport athlete who thought that was going to be his future. He'd been raised in a home by a dad who took his family to church, but his parents were not outspoken about their faith. It rarely, rarely came up in conversation. And so Gary really didn't have a strong uh, pursuit of Jesus Christ and following him as a part of his upbringing. At 16, though, Gary was playing quarterback and doing exceptionally well. Uh, he anticipated being able to choose whichever college he might want to play for. And perhaps if things had gone well, that he might actually be a candidate for the NFL. And Gary said, I prayed before every game, but once the game started, I was concerned more with college scouts than with Jesus. I made certain I had time for weightlifting and running, but not for Bible study and prayer. I was on my way, and in quotes, he says, my plan, unquote, was working great. And then early in the season, a defensive lineman planted his shoulder pad directly into my knee, tearing my ACL, MCL, and meniscus, which back in 1975 would generally be considered a career-ending injury. 
Gary said the people who had encouraged him in his life of sports and celebrated his success up to that point slowly disappeared from his life one by one. And God be, or Gary rather became very angry at God, thinking, why me, God? What did I deserve to get this punishment? His grades began to sink and his faith sank along with it. We're in the middle of a series called Beyond Galilee. We're looking at the first eight chapters of the book or gospel of Mark. And I've told you every week that Mark's gospel is the shortest and the earliest written of the four accounts of Jesus' life, ministry, death, and resurrection we have in the Bible. And it was written to the first generation of Christians who at the time Mark was writing the gospel were beginning to experience some very intense persecution. They were facing the loss of their homes, their jobs, their belongings. They were facing perhaps imprisonment or torture or in some cases even execution because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And this very fast-changing social status that they had was forcing them to ask some very pointed questions. Questions like, is Jesus really who I was told he is? And is he worth losing everything possibly to follow him? And this gospel is in part Mark's answer to those two questions. And those are questions that people still ask today. Now, most scholars will say that they think that Mark's gospel was written in or near the city of Rome. And it was written specifically to people who lived in Rome who were Christians. Some, perhaps most of them, were Jewish by birth. But a significant number of them were also Gentile Christians. Jewish Christians facing this kind of persecution by Gentiles who were not part of their faith might have questioned the legitimacy and the motives behind the actions and words of those Gentile Christians in their church. Are they really who we think they are or will they sell me out? if the opportunity arises. And Gentile Christians who often wondered whether Jews fully accepted them because of their pagan background and their ethnic background might have wondered similarly whether the Jewish believers had good intentions toward them. Now, over the past couple of weeks, we've looked at Mark chapter 6 and the first half of chapter 7, and we've seen numerous places where Jesus and his disciples had faced open hostility from people that we might have been a little bit surprised they faced hostility from. Jesus went home to the city of Nazareth, and there he was threatened with death, and people were very angry at the things that he said. King Herod actually executed Jesus' cousin, and friend John the Baptist. And although Jesus miraculously fed 5,000 mostly Jewish people in a wilderness, an act that only one with the power of God would be able to do, and then later that night he walked on water to the boat where his disciples were rowing and explicitly made a claim to be not only the Messiah and the Son of God, but God himself, his own disciples, even refused to believe he was who he was. And Mark tells us that was because they were hard-hearted. In chapter 7, last week, we saw Jesus face some more intense persecution from Pharisees and scribes who came all the way to where he was from Jerusalem. These men were the cream of the religious crop. And they came to challenge his authority by questioning him on what he was teaching the people who followed him. Things like rules for cleanliness. They tried to undermine his authority and his teaching. And he responded by saying, your rules are man-made. They don't come from God and they don't make you clean. And your cleanness is measured by the transformation of your heart and what comes out of you because of that transformation that God has done. So Jesus was facing opposition from all different camps And halfway through chapter 7, we see him taking a break. He leaves town and he goes quite far away. So let's look at Mark chapter 7 beginning in verse 24. It says, And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden 
But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged Jesus to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, for this statement, you may go your way, the demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in a bed and the demon gone. So each week in this series, I've talked to you about where Jesus was. And I told you that the first four chapters of the Gospel of Mark are focused on the city of Capernaum. That's the place where Jesus began his adult ministry on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. But I also have told you that starting in chapter 5 and going through chapter 8, we see Jesus expanding his ministry. He went to places further away from Capernaum on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, places is like Gennesaret and the region of the Gerasenes. And he left the Sea of Galilee, went beyond Galilee completely, and went into towns farther away like Nazareth and Bethsaida. And in addition to that, Jesus sent his own disciples out to various towns that he could not go directly to for the sake of time to extend his message to a much broader audience. Now, verse 24 that we just read says, Jesus went to Tyre and he went to Sidon. Now, both cities are coastal cities, quite a distance north of the Sea of Galilee, right along what we now today call the Mediterranean Sea. Both of them had protected, naturally protected harbors, and they had big fortresses, and they were cities of some uh, prominence in Jesus's day. Both uh, were, had been given, that territory they were in had been given to the nation of Israel centuries before when Joshua led them into the promised land. But the tribes that were supposed to take control of those areas never did. And so the areas maintained a consistent Gentile heavy population. And Tyre was a very wealthy city. It was inhabited and ruled by the Gentiles. And most of the Jews who were familiar with Tyre thought less of the people there, of the Tyrians. They thought they thought they were people who were not interested in God at all. They were interested only in their paganism and their wealth. And likewise, most people living in Tyre also despised the Jews. So when Jesus arrived in Tyre, he wanted to be discreet. But at this point in his ministry, Jesus did not have the capacity to be discreet. People followed him everywhere. And as soon as they discovered he was in their town, they would bring people to see him, to see if he could solve their problems, heal them, teach them, take care of the things that were big needs for them. And so scripture tells us, Mark tells us that a Syrophoenician woman immediately came to him for help with her daughter when she discovered that he was in town. Now the Syrophoenicians were people descended directly from the Canaanite people who were the enemies of Israel during most of the Old Testament era. Mark does not say that this particular woman was wealthy, but he knew that his first readers would assume so, given the city that she lived in and the freedom with which she approached and spoke to a man, especially a man from another culture. And so the fact that he doesn't contradict that assumption of his readers leads us to believe that she might have been a woman of some prominence. Most scholars would say she probably was at least used to the good living that people in Tyre experienced and probably thought little of the Jews who were much poorer who lived in the region around the Sea of Galilee. But her daughter was demon controlled and a rabbi from that area was in town and people heard that he could heal. Now, verses 25 and 26 said this, she came and fell down at his feet and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Now, think about for a minute the humility 
that would be required for a wealthy, probably prominent Gentile woman living in a culture that looked down on Jews as inferior and worshipped other gods to go to a Jewish rabbi to fall at his feet and to beg him by the power of his God to save your child. When I lived in San Diego, which I lived there for about 30 years, I knew a number of people who went to Mexico for their medical care. Now, some went because they didn't have good insurance and Mexican medical care was often less expensive than U.S. care. But a few of them actually went because they had significant medical issues and their U.S. doctors had exhausted their options and they had heard that Mexican hospitals and doctors still offered a few other options that they couldn't get here. Now, I'm going to tell you, and you'll think less of me when I tell you this, I remember the same thought crossed my mind every time I heard someone say, I'm being treated in Mexico. And the thought was something like this. Why would you trust a third world doctor over a U.S. doctor? Now, I admit that that is a very condescending thing to think. And I am not proud that that is what often went through my head. And some people would probably receive that as a racist attitude also, although I don't think I was thinking of it in racial terms. I know for a fact that many doctors in Mexico are well-trained and highly skilled, and some are world-renowned in their fields. So at best, my attitude was unfairly prejudicial. So why share that with you guys? Why take, a, take the chance of lessening how you might think about me? Because I know that some of you immediately thought the same thing. When I said, I knew people in San Diego who went to Mexico for health care. And that thought that you just had, that I often had, was the same kind of attitude that a wealthy Syrophoenician woman would encounter if she said to her family and friends, I am going to go see a rabbi from Galilee. I've heard he can do more than our gods can do. Would you and I have had the humility to do what the woman did in those circumstances? When we read stories like this, we usually identify with the person who has faith. Yet we rarely give evidence of the humility that many of those people in those stories were forced to show evidence of. And the truth is that Jesus rewards the faith that shows genuine evidence of humility. Does your faith or my faith show that evidence of humility? Or does it demand that Jesus acknowledge what we think is right and good in us, our social status, our political beliefs, our justice claims, our moral indignation before we will agree to come to him and follow him? If you or I cannot follow a Jesus that doesn't agree with everything we think is true, our faith is not in the real Jesus. When we think of Jesus, we actually think of a man who would never say a harsh word to anyone who did not deserve it like a Pharisee or a scribe or someone who is deliberately self-righteous. And so this passage is incredibly troublesome for us. When the Gentile woman comes to Jesus and she says, please cast out, she begs, please cast out the demon in my daughter. Verse 27 says, he said, let the children, the Jews, be fed first. 
For it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs, the Gentiles. Jesus essentially called this woman a dog to her face. Dogs, with very few exceptions in first world cultures, were considered to be undesirable and unclean animals. Now, for centuries, scholars have sought ways to minimize what Jesus said because it bothers us so much that he would say that to her face. And so some of them say he must have said it with a smile. He must have winked at her or her body language or his body language must have told her that he was just saying dogs with air quotes. And she really understood that. Some people actually go as far as saying, well, Jesus used the word for little dog or house dog. And so Jesus meant it in an affectionate way. And the woman sensed that. But that is not true. And the woman's response to Jesus makes it clear that she knew he was not downplaying the harshness of the word dog. Jesus was using a common expression that Jews used to describe Gentiles, and all the Gentiles knew it. Now, was he showing animosity toward the woman? No, he was not. He was making a very specific point, a simple statement of the recognition of the primary mission that God the Father had given to him. Matthew chapter 15, which shares this same story with more details, actually tells us that at first Jesus refused even to speak to her. And when his disciples came to her and said, this woman will not go away, would you please just tell her to leave? He answers by saying this, I was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. If that's not a slam of the door in her face, then Mark got it wrong. And there is no way to spin this statement to make it more palatable to her. So what is going on? If Jesus wasn't joking, if he wasn't showing affection, what was he doing? Jesus was saying, I must focus on what God told me to do first and foremost. And that is to go to my people, the Jews, not to exclude your people, the Gentiles, but so that my people can reach your people with the truth that God has called me to proclaim. There's an author and a Bible scholar named Trevin Wax He says this, Jesus' ministry was to the lost sheep of the house of Israel precisely because he is the good shepherd come to gather the renewed Israel around himself and to launch their trajectory into the world with the healing grace God always intended to flow to others through his chosen people. And he ends with this line, Jesus ministered to the Jews for the Gentiles. But why use this dog expression? On occasions when first century people ate and dogs were permitted in the room, perhaps a banquet and the dog came and sat at your feet, the attention of those serving the food was never on the dogs. The people serving the food were paying attention to the guests. God called them his children. To stop serving the guests and feed the dogs would be to distract from the mission of the meal. Jesus was not calling this Gentile woman a second-class person. He was saying, I must concentrate my efforts, and that includes the healings that I do on those I need to reach first, so they in turn will reach others, including people like you and your family. Now, how did the woman react? How would you and I react to that kind of an in, in your face, sharp, insulting comment? 
It's unlikely that any of us in this room would have reacted the way this woman reacted. Imagine what you'd be thinking. You'd be indignant. And you'd be saying, I'm offended, Jesus. I am not a dog. I am not less than the Jewish people you have healed and taught. I'm at least as valuable as them. And I bet I'm better than some of them. I can't believe you'd put your plan ahead of my need. And don't we do that ourselves all the time? Don't we say to God, why aren't you meeting my need in my timing the way I want it met? I can't believe you'd put your plan ahead of me. This Gentile woman could have reacted the way that Gary Kowatch, the guy I was telling you about at the beginning of the service, she could have said, what did I do to deserve what's happened to me? First, my daughter becomes demon controlled and now you're, you're turning me away, Jesus? Whatever did I deserve for you to not fix that? You brought this into my life. If you represent God, the least you could do is fix this one problem for me. But the Gentile woman doesn't react like that. Look at verse 28. But she answered him, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Was that an argument meant to get different treatment? No. She stayed persistent, but she continued to acknowledge that she needed to approach Jesus with humility. Here's a Gentile woman, a descendant of Canaanite, enemies of Israel. And she first, before she says anything else, calls Jesus Lord. She is the first person in the gospel of Mark to call Jesus Lord. She says to him, effectively, I humbly accept your plan is the best plan. And I believe that your plan is big enough to benefit me too, as you choose to let it overflow to me. Now, I am almost certain, knowing the pride in my heart, that if Jesus had said something like that to me about one of my kids, if I went to him in the same circumstances and I was from the same group she was from, that I would have walked away angry and offended. Deep inside, I would have thought, what right does he have to talk to me like that? I'm doubtful I would have said, Lord, I humbly accept that your plan is the best plan. And I believe that it's big enough that if you chose, it could overflow to me. And perhaps you're a lot like me. Pride gives up in rejection, especially when our plans for our lives are rejected because God does not answer them the way we want. But faith, real faith, like this woman had, shows persistence in humility. Her faith was persistent, yet humble, and her daughter was healed. Where did Jesus go next? Look at chapter 7, verses 31 to 37. It says this, Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee, so back to his home area, in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying he has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. 
Now, verse 31 tells us almost in passing of a remarkable journey that Jesus went on. Jesus left Tyre on the northern coast of what is today Israel, and he went home by going away from home. He went north to go south. He went to Sidon, and then he journeyed through the interior of Israel back to the Sea of Galilee and into the region that on the screen there is marked Decapolis. There were 10 Gentile cities in the region of the Decapolis. Jesus made a trip which most scholars estimate probably took months, and it was entirely encompassed by Gentile lands. What does Mark tell us that happened there? Almost nothing. A journey of months is just a parenthesis in the Gospel of Mark. Why? Mark starts with this Syrophoenician woman in Tyre. He ends with a deaf man with a speech impediment in the Decapolis. Why skip so many other places? Did Jesus do nothing? It's very unlikely he did nothing. For the same reason that Jesus gave to the woman when he told her, your daughter has been freed from the demon. He said, this is not my primary mission. My primary mission is to equip the Jews, my people, to reach out to the Gentiles, everyone else. But most of Mark's first readers who knew where these cities were would realize Jesus went on a long trip and he actually went through the entire region that most Jews would never set foot in. He walked through areas and met the needs of people that the Jews would not expect him to meet the needs of. Some of Mark's readers were Jewish, some were Gentile, and they would see in this brief instance that Jesus spent a great amount of unreported time ministering to the Gentiles too. What did Jesus do for this deaf speech impaired man who was probably also a Gentile that the others brought to him in the region of the Decapolis. Verse 33 says, And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, touched his tongue. And we read this and we think, how weird. But Mark's first readers would see, that's not weird. That's actually an unusual act of compassion. Why is it an act of compassion? First, Jesus takes this man aside privately. Why do that? A guy who's deaf, who can only speak in ways that draw attention to him, perhaps mispronouncing words, perhaps making sounds that seemed inappropriate, would always be hyper aware of people watching him, people paying attention to how different he was. And in the first century world, people believing that this had come on him because he or his parents had engaged in a grievous sin that angered their gods. So Jesus, to avoid the crowd and to avoid their judgment of this man, took him aside privately. Next, Jesus says, put his fingers in his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue. And we read that and we think, gross. Why in the world would he do that? Was it necessary to heal the man? No, it absolutely was not necessary to heal the man. This was actually Jesus' way of telling the man what he was about to do. When he put his fingers in the man's ears and pulled his fingers out, this guy can't hear. We don't know if he can read lips. This is Jesus' sign language to the man. I am going to unstop your ears. When he spit, he spit in his hand, and he put the spit on the man's tongue. Now it's even grosser, isn't it? But in the first century, most people believed the spit of highly public people with great power had healing properties. They would go to great leaders and ask them to spit on their wounds because they thought it would heal their wounds. So Jesus spits on his hand, knowing the man is going to believe that has magical properties, and puts it on his tongue to show him what he's about to do. 
He can't tell him because he's deaf. This is Jesus telling him in signs. Did those actions heal the man? No. Those actions told the man what to expect next. The actual healing comes in verses 34 and 35. And, he, and looking up to heaven, Jesus sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Before Jesus spoke the healing words, he prayed. And he did things the deaf man would recognize as prayer. He looked up to heaven and he took a deep breath and sighed to heaven. The man couldn't hear his words, but he could see that Jesus was communicating with the Father. And the healing would come through him from the Father. Then, and only then, was the man healed when Jesus by the power of God, said, be opened. When we read this account, and we read it superficially, it's very tempting to try to discern steps. There are even churches that will try to teach you that there are certain steps you have to follow if you want healing from Jesus. We hope that maybe we can repeat them ourselves, but that's not what Jesus was doing here. And it's not what he wants us to do either. Mark's readers including us, are meant to take something extraordinary from this particular encounter and what Jesus did. Did These are not steps to be repeated. These are signs of extraordinary compassion. The Gentile man brought to Jesus had a unique set of needs. And Jesus met them uniquely. And he does that for us too because he has the same compassion for us that he had for that man. Jesus meets our needs in ways that show compassion for who we are. When Gary Kowach tore his, well, two tendons and his meniscus and had this, what would normally be a career-ending injury, he spent eight months recovering. And in his story, he told at his retirement he said, a handful of people partially refocused me. I began dating a girl who was committed to her faith, and she steered me more towards God. My track coach bluntly reminded me of my academic eligibility requirements and told me to get my act in gear with my grades. I had patient friends and a Christian cousin who ministered to me with care. I was still angry, but I started to move on. And then when he actually got out of the hospital, he decided his next step was to run track. But he said, I fell back into the same routine. I prayed before every race, fully expecting God to support my success and my plan on the track. That summer, he showed up for football again to discover that he'd been replaced at quarterback, which makes sense because he hadn't been there for the season. And so the spot they had available for him was wide receiver. He was excited. He was back on plan again, but he said it took one practice to realize I could not make the starts and stops and turns that a wide receiver needed to make with my knee in the condition that was in. So I shook the coach's hand and went home angry all over again. But at some point, though, something began to change, and I really realized there was more to my life than my self-centered plans. I was meant to be part of something bigger than a sports team. And something began to tug at my heart and pointing my focus to other people on helping people, especially on helping them not to be like me, not to handle life challenges the way I handle them. Somewhat ironically, I felt compelled to do whatever I could to help people find constructive ways to move forward. And so Gary went to Penn State, enrolled in a program for counseling and social sciences, and spent his career ministering to others. He said along the way he met his wife, Kim, who just happened to be a faithful Christian. And together, they and her family learned how to depend more deeply on God and his plan. He said, in 1992, while driving to work one day, I saw a silly bumper sticker on a car in front of me you may have seen. It said, men plan, dot, 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 
and God laughs. Sitting at that red light, after everything I'd experienced over many years, I suddenly got it. 1975 was a long time ago, and I still admittedly get a little twinge of what could have been every time fall football starts. Who knows where I'd be if my plan had worked. But I know today I wouldn't be in a nearly as good a place as I am because of God's plan for me. I still make plans. I still get frustrated when they don't work out but usually only for a minute because I know God has always had an even better plan in mind. These two people, a Syrophoenician woman, a Decapolis man, could have walked up to Jesus and said, why, if you represent God, tell me why he let me experience what I'm experiencing now. But they didn't do that. Why did they experience that? So you and I could see a God who rewards a faith that acknowledges and is persistent in humility, and God has compassion for us based upon who we are. This passage ends with a very interesting verse that most of the time we simply overlook. It says, the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. He wanted them to stay silent, but they didn't. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, he has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. The audiences who watched these acts and whatever else happened over the months that Jesus walked through Gentile lands, were focused on the miraculous healings. But without realizing what they were saying, they said something very remarkable. He has done all things well. Jesus does have a plan. It may not look like what we think, but it's the best one. Would you stand with me? I'm going to close this in a word of prayer. Father God, we are grateful for your word. We're grateful for the fact that there are people who lived in an actual historical time and place who encountered you and behaved in ways that allow us to look inside of ourselves and to see who we are and how we might behave in our encounters with you. Although those people probably lived difficult lives and questioned whether you were real and you cared, they were able to experience the truth of who you are and their faith was made strong. Lord, we pray that as we seek to follow you in a faith that shows humility, that you will reward us as you rewarded them. May we see your compassion played out in unique and special ways because you designed us for the lives you have planned for us. Thank you for your gracious care for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, We hope you have a good week. Join us for one of our classes or guest reception, and we'll see you next time.